We're today going to talk a little more detail and a little more offensively minded looking at TEs and Tresome. Um, we'll have a couple caveats here in a second, but first, uh, I'm Josh. Uh, this is Charles. We're with the Tretis Partners. Uh, Tretis is a kind of R&D shop for hire slash consulting firm for security and cyber related things. Been in business for a couple of years. We tend to either do analysis for like major cell phone manufacturers would bring us in to look at um, maybe a new sock that they're looking to put in a phone or maybe the next uh, consulting engagement we will do is someone asking about smart grid. We definitely, we go deep and broad on our topics. Um, the other thing that we've been doing more and more recently because people ask is trying to figure out how to use TEEs or how to replace TEEs or um, if they can trust the TEE. So we do not have the same, the world is, is good view maybe. Um, so I would like to caveat right up front that we have never looked at Trustonic um, and if we say anything that you disagree with, please call us out. Um, we're going to primarily be focused on Qualcomm uh, in this talk. So in theory, and we saw a lot of this in the last set of slides too, um, especially the, the diagrams from the ARM consortium for how trusted execution should work. Um, remember that those are white paper documents. That is a theory ARM. ARM itself does not really make a chip, right? They make a design for a processor and then that processor gets implemented by companies like Qualcomm. Um, and so it is a reference guide. It's how you expect the chip to behave and the chips do come out of the factory behaving like that to some extent. But there are implementation details between design and, and actually what gets shipped in your phone that are maybe a little more squishy um, just because the way they're designed. So you mentioned secure boot for TE. Um, how that works on a Qualcomm chip is you've got two to four cores that are sitting um, on your phone doing processing. Core zero is what's going to be running trust zone. So in the boot chain, you put power to your phone, you get a very small stage one bootloader that does a little bit, start spinning up the processors. You have stage 2.1 or 2.A, depending on the docs, that does a little more. That actually spins up trust zone, at which point from that point on, trust zone running in core zero will validate everything else. Um, but there's still a, trust zone itself is being validated by an external source that ends up being the uh, little bitty ARM core that does power management on your phone. Um, so it's, it's, it's trusted, but it's still slightly mushy on occasion. Um, so things like that. And it looks great in a design from ARM, but then when you look at implementation, there are, are, are points that you can poke at and they may or may not fail. Um, so, trust zone, uh, yeah, I think we already talked about this. I mean, it, it's hyped as a, let's take something that we wished was all secure, which is an Android phone and a Linux kernel and all that stuff, and let's just go ahead and accept that it's not going to be fully secure for everything. So let's magically do something else that's going to be secure, that is another operating system running on the same chip um, in its own little box and just pretend that if we couldn't secure this big thing, maybe we can secure this little thing. And in theory we can, right? Um, but this little thing is only secure when we know all the code that's running in it and we trust all the code that's running in it. Yeah, we've kind of seen this, um, so I'll skip by. Uh, yeah. A bunch, like everyone else, we have a bunch, whole bunch of things that we would love to see happen. We'd love to see truly secure banking. Um, all your demos about e-voting and whatnot would be excellent. Um, but what TZ really is, at the end of the day, is 
DRM, so Disney, uh, all the movie theaters, or all the movie studios, um, all the cell phone providers, what's not up here is you also have another slew of companies writing code that runs in uh, the trusted environment, which is all of your actual manufacturers. So Samsung will have specific code. Motorola will have specific code. Um, they all have vague APIs that they're supposed to follow, but at the end of the day, it is a bunch, a bunch of companies writing code that is not in any way open or public or reviewable at all. And it's then shoved into a very black box that's very hard to do an assessment on to see if it's good secure code or not. So it's kind of like this big blob of code written by a whole bunch of companies that aren't really writing it to be secure. It is written to be hard to get to a lot of times, um, which is different than trying to write it to be secure. Um, also, especially in the Qualcomm implementation, obviously we've got DRM running over there. Uh, we have Q fuses, which are basically one-time blowable fuses. You have 16K of fuses sitting um, inside TE, or inside Trust Zone as itself. Um, those fuses are like used to burn uh, the keys that are used to talk to the um, cell towers. They're the uh, base key for the phone. They're the base keys for your providers. Um, these are all, like I said, one-time programmable. There's code uh, that I've published before that will show you how to burn fuses um, so you can write your own fuses. Uh, it's not very easy to read all of the fuses. There are some that are accessible from user land or at least from the kernel. Um, there's others that are, in theory, only accessible from uh, inside Trust Zone. Uh, that is held up so far, but I don't feel like we've poked that hard trying to read all of the fuses. But they are, we, we know where they are and we know how to access some of them. Um, that's used for that. Uh, Yeah, you've got OEM specific stuff, so uh, bootloader unlocking. A lot of bootloader unlocking is going to be somewhat controlled or at least the flags for locking and unlocking bootloader will be controlled inside TEs. Um, yeah, secure boot settings. Uh, on Qualcomm in particular, JTAG, so can, you, can I hook up debugging gear and debug my phone? Um, there's a fuse that can be blown that says turn JTAG off. Uh, Qualcomm, in their documentation, highly suggests that you blow this fuse before you mass produce and ship devices out to end consumers. There's a fuse right next to it that says, okay, I was wrong, go ahead and turn JTAG back on um, because they want the ability for phones that get broken out in the real world and come back to be looked at. They want those phones to, for the techs to be able to JTAG and figure out what happened with the hardware. That makes a lot of logical sense. Um, and then there's a third fuse that Qualcomm says, don't ever blow because you'll never be able to turn JTAG back on that does fully turn it off again. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's logical things that make logical sense and then you put them in a device that goes out to customers and it gets squishy and mushy and there's ways for security researchers to poke and make things happen that shouldn't. Um, yeah, uh, Samsung Knox which would be a whole talk on itself, is also relying heavily. Um, okay, so this picture that we're not supposed to make any bigger, probably not supposed to have on our deck at all, um, is the Qualcomm layout for what is in the 8960. Does anyone have a Samsung phone made in the past two years or a Motorola phone made in the past two years? Like anyone? I'm sure, okay. Um, it's that sock. Uh, it's what's running in your pocket right now. Uh, you have four cores, you have a whole bunch of memory, um, a lot of peripherals, it's all on one nice little chip. Um, so yeah, this is running QC. Um, the other thing that we haven't poked at before we get into the problems that we have found, uh, there are buses that are accessible uh, 
um, directly into trust zone memory, uh, into the secure memory space that are pro potentially manipulatable at a hardware level and maybe at a kernel level. Um, but those spending a couple days on them has failed so far, but they still seem slightly problematic. Um, so yeah, we've already covered this. Everyone in the Android world's pretty much running um, some variant of Trust Zone. Blackberry is doing the same thing. Windows phones are doing the same thing. And at a hardware level, they're all really interacting. Um, as mentioned a little before, but basically the main interaction point between user land kernel and trusted execution secure world is the SMC calls. Um, they're not always, are they always fully public? I didn't think they were. What do you mean they're fully public? Is there a publish to these are the APIs that you shall use? No. Um, yes. You can glean them from some Android open source. But you can't get all of them. Um, so, and yeah, um, it was covered really well in the last talk, so I won't go into it, but there's, there's basically the four ways to talk talk to it or what it can talk to. SMC calls is the obvious correct path. Um, there's some interrupt vector places that you can um, queue up interactions. There's shared memory uh, that was already covered. Hopefully it's always shared on the other side of the wall. That's not always the case. And then peripherals. Um, yeah, so like I said, we are taking a big box, which is the Android Linux kernel calling it insecure and then making another smaller box inside that box and saying this is going to be secure because it's a kernel inside of a kernel inside of a kernel. Um, inside this kernel, it is small, so we lose a lot of the protections that we would actually have at the higher layer, right? We don't have AS ASLR, we don't have DEP at this layer. Um, there's no, all of the trust for trust zone is built on the fact that you as an attacker should not be able to do anything in that world. Um, that is the, for the most part, that is the sole protection there, is the assumption that that wall is unbreachable. Um, inside that wall, inside the secure world, uh, as of a couple years ago, it used to be one just big blob jumble of code. Now it is a little more architected, um, but you still you have a lot of vendors throwing code in there that you can't see um, and everyone just believes it's good because you do have that one wall of separation. But we lose all of the other um, protections that we would have at a higher layer. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, as you would expect when you have multiple vendors doing multiple things inside of a black box, some of them follow the Qualcomm spec on how to do things. Some of them go, eh, we're smarter than Qualcomm, we'll do it ourselves. Um, you have a lot of combinations of the two. Uh, Trust Zone on inside a SOC also has the ability to reach out and talk to other peripherals so you can have like a direct channel to the baseband. Um, that is interesting, but not something that we'll go into greater detail on today due to time. Um, yeah. I feel like I'm rushing because all my stuff was already covered. <laughs> so yeah, here is the spec as gleamed by us, or here is what is called, um, I think we'll probably back reference this when Charles starts talking in a second, um, a services list. And then I'm going to let Charles talk from here. Um, how's the audio on this? Is it good? All right, perfect. Um, so just taking a quick step back, um, these SCM calls, which is how the Android kernel will interface with uh, the trusted execution environment on Qualcomm, 
Um, this is what it exposes. It's kind of an eyesore, it's not really important what's shown there. But the important thing is there's 50, 60, some odd, some, something in that range, um, different functions that we can attack. So that's really the easiest attack surface. Um, beyond these, for each different uh, vendor OEM, they might add additional functionality. So the previous slide was what Qualcomm provides, and then OEMs add something new. And so my personal favorite one on this is, um, wish I had a laser pointer. This, this one's called OEM Do Something. And it's on the Xperia, and it's also on the HTC One. So if you look at it, it actually doesn't do anything, but you can tell that Qualcomm gave like a developer kit to someone who has never developed a TEE before. And that's debug code that they just left in because they're not familiar with it. So you kind of have this impression that the implement, whoever implemented these functions is kind of making it work. They don't really know the environment that they're operating in. And so we think this might be a great, you know, attack vector. This is a good place to look for um, trying to compromise the integrity of Trust Zone. Um, and again, you know, the, the problem with Trust Zone is it's closed source. It, it's, it has to do with DRM protecting private keys. This is not something people want publicly available. So it's a big black box. And you have the chip manufacturers, you have Qualcomm, NVIDIA, you have um, the OEMs, the carriers that are putting their bootloader unlocking, the carrier unlocking in there. You have maybe Netflix who is trying to do their own DRM. You have Discredix. So Discredix is a company that sells DRM software to vendors, and that software can then find its way into Trust Zone. So you end up with like open source libraries in here too, like OpenSSL. Um, you can find a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, all right, that was Josh's already summarized that. So what I'm really gonna walk through, and I apologize because there's kind of a lot of source code here, but we, we were curious if, we, if Trust Zone on Qualcomm was secure. You know, what does secure mean? Should we use it? And so we tried to answer it not with gut feelings, but to actually try to compromise it. And so I'm gonna walk through the process that we did and end up with an exploit that runs, uh, that gives us arbitrary code execution on HTC devices. Um, one of the questions that I always get when I get this is like, how do you get the Trust Zone image? Because it, it seems really complex, but on uh, Android, you just find the name block devices and there's one name Trust Zone and then you can just DD that and then you have the Trust Zone image. So now you can start reverse engineering that, trying to find vulnerabilities and trying to identify how it works. So getting Trust Zone image, very easy. Um, we've already kind of talked about these SCM and those are secure channel monitor calls which execute, which are invoked by the ARM secure monitor call instruction. So there's SCM and SMC and they are very tightly related, but you, know, you can confuse the two. And whenever the kernel, so only the Android kernel, this can't be done from user space. So only the kernel can talk to the trusted execution environment with the SMC instruction. And the way that does it is it puts the request in memory and it puts its response buffer after that. And the response buffer has a flag that says, is this request complete? And that flag is set on the trusted execution environment. And so it'll issue that request and then it'll start pulling that flag. And once the trusted and execution environment sets that, then it can handle the response. Um, tons more detail in the Android open source. You can look there if you're curious. But the interface to Trust Zone isn't really documented at all. So we have to reverse engineer it to figure out how everything works. So that big table that we had before, we generated that because very conveniently within Trust Zone is this table. And this is just a snippet of it. But what it contains is an ID for each function, the name of what that function is so we know what it does, which is very convenient for the reverse engineer so I don't actually have to figure out what it does. Um, it has what values it returns. So if it returns a buffer, a shared buffer, or just like a return code, success or failure. It has a function pointer to what handles that on the trust zone side. And then it has, um, it's kind of very hard to see, but that's 244. 
What that means is it takes in two parameters. The first parameter is four bytes long. The second parameter is four bytes long. So using this, you can get a very good understanding of what they take in as arguments, how they're processed, et cetera, et cetera. So starting from here, um, we started looking at HTC. Um, we chose HTC because there are some really nice functions they exposed, read memory, write memory, mem copy. So it was like, it may have been naive, but I really thought, hey, maybe they're, I could just invoke mem copy and then just copy trust zone data, maybe extract keys. That would be really cool. That would be a great talk. It's just like, well, I invoked mem copy and compromised the integrity of trust zone. Um, fortunately, it wasn't quite that simple. Um, HTC does this neat thing where they have this bit mask, and whenever one of those uh, SCM services is no longer needed, they disable it. So Qual Qualcomm doesn't do this, so even if you know, one of those services will never really need to be used, if it was only used for secure boot, it's still available, so if there's a vulnerability, it can still be triggered from the Android side. Um, so I kind of like what Qualcomm's doing in terms of you know, memcopy might have an ID of 20, and this is service that is disabled. It, there's a global bit mask, and if the 20th bit is one, you can invoke this service. If the 20th bit is zero, you can't. So it's kind of a neat thing. Okay, so here's the vulnerability that we found um, within Qualcomm, or uh, HTC's Qualcomm implementation. Um, it's Implemented, it's OEM discretic, so it was something that discretic added for doing DRM. And we control both parameters. So because we control both parameters, and in the example trusted application that um, the previous talk had, it had a check saying, let's make sure the buffer that I'm provided is from the non-secure world. There's no check that that buffer is on a non-secure world. So this gives us the ability to make any address in trust zone, or really on the entire memory of the, uh, of the phone, override it with the value of this global that happens to always be zero. So the first vulnerability we have, we can make any address on the device zero. It's a good start. Um, elsewhere in HTCs, implementation, we do see some address validation. So what it's trying to make sure is this is another uh, SCM service, and it's doing validation of the buffer that you provide. So the validation that it's doing is saying, are you trying to write to trust zone memory? If you are, fail. OK. That's good, I guess, right? They're doing something. But there are problems with this. Um, if you provide a very large length, you get an integer overflow, and you can g trigger writes. Um, what if you provide something greater than 2A03F zeros? Um, it'll write there. And an interesting thing about HTC's implementation is Discredix's uh, code was so large that um, Trust Zone expanded past this constant value, which is normally where trust zone ended. So you can actually write to portions of trust zone with, you know, despite the validation. And, you know, Qualcomm's a sock, right? It's, it's very complex. It's got tons of uh, peripherals that might have exposed memory. And this is really only checking the region of memory that trust zone's in. There are plenty of other secure memory segments that you could then use this to kind of bypass and overwrite. So major problems with the uh, validation that HCC does here. Um, it's kind of an eyesore. It's not super important, but we're going back to the mem copy that, because like I really wanted to use mem copy. I, I thought that would, be, that would be fun, right? But so what mem copy is doing is it's saying, is my service enabled? Yes, no. Turns out they do disable it. So I fail right there. If they didn't disable it, they're doing that same sort of checking um, for if I mem copying to or from trust zone memory, and I'm trying to overwrite trust zone, I would fail there again. Then they do more validation, and nah, it's not important. Okay, 
So what I want, you know, I'm trying to compromise this thing. It would be really nice if that was the implementation of memcopy, because that's what in my head, that's what memcopy should be, right? Where I provide the source, the destination, the link, and the overwrite any data that I want within Trust Zone. Um, but unfortunately, there's that validation, the disabling thing. Very annoying. So what can we do about it? Because all we have is this little silly write zero vulnerability. And we tried a, a bunch of things before having this realization of they couldn't possibly have done something this dumb. Um, so a quick refresher for arm and thumb. Uh, in thumb mode, zeros is a not instruction. It moves R0 to R0. In arm mode, it's also a not. OK. So suddenly, our write zero vulnerability is a write not vulnerability. So what we do with our new write not vulnerability is here's the assembly from uh, the mem copy. And all that validation that we saw before, we just remove it. So the only thing that's left is the call to the mem copy and returning success, which is exactly what we want to do. Um, so here's the final exploit code for what we have. Um, it's seven lines. This is not a complex ex exploit. This is uh, very straightforward. All we do is we alloc a buffer, we remove all the validation, and then we invoke mem copy to co copy arbitrary data into or out of trust zone. So to be clear, we're writing these zeros, these NOP instructions, which are being executed within trust zone. So this gives us the ability to run arbitrary code within trust zone, because we can now use this to copy shell code, overwrite trust zone memory, um, extract keys. This, gives, this is keys to the kingdom with uh, seven lines of code. Um, and I should say, this is something that is a problem with HTC's implementation. But the larger problem here is an architectural one. Trust zone, or Qualcomm's trust zone, doesn't have these protections that you would normally expect, you know, ASLR in depth. Um, it's, it's written in such a way that you're passing physical memory buffers back and forth, which relies on every single one of these services to do proper validation. If one of those services doesn't, it's game over. You get arbitrary code execution. And we have this one very simple write vulnerability. And using this write vulnerability, we can gain arbitrary code execution. And it's architected in such a way that the only vulnerabilities that you're going to find are write vulnerabilities. So it's, it's, it's squishy. It's very, it's, it doesn't make me feel good. It's not where I want to put you know, all of my trust and this is going to be a very secure environment. This is going to protect my personal information. It might be fine for protecting DRM that you know, I don't really care about as long as my, you know, my Netflix app plays. Um, let's see where we are on time. All right, got plenty of time. So when we first came up with this, uh, it's not actually the FEM. All right. <laughs> um, we had a feeling that uh, the previous trust zone talk was going to cover a lot of the introductory material, and so we'd kind of get through this very quickly. Um, so we kind of frantically added more content, so uh, bear with us. But when we first found this vulnerability, we made this claim that it's, it's architected in such a way that you're going to find right vulnerabilities. And these write vulnerabilities, as we've just shown, can be made to get gain code execution. Well, there's a great little blog post here about someone who found a write vulnerability in Qualcomm's implementation of Trust Zone. So no longer specific to HTC. But it's a, uh, it's a write vulnerability that really affects every Android device in this room. So feel good about that. Um, and coincidentally enough, it's actually a, another write zero vulnerability. So I'm going to quickly walk through a little bit of comparison of how Qualcomm is different from HTC. So remember how HTC was doing that validation? It was just checking that one small memory range. These are the memory ranges that Qualcomm cares about. So you see there's like 10 secure regions. HTC was only checking one of them. But Qualcomm does check them all, so that's good. Um, here's the function that checks it, which basically just iterates it over. And whenever a buffer is passed to the trust zone, it says, 
let me loop over all of those memory regions, and if there's a secure memory region, it sees if there's an overlap. If there's an overlap, it rejects the request. But how can we um, take one of these memory regions and use a write vulnerability to bypass it? There's, there's tons of different ways, depending on what value you can write. Um, if you have a write zero vulnerability, just overwrite the boundaries. That's the start and end of the secure region. Okay, you bypass this check. You can make the ID negative one because it stops when it sees an ID of negative one. Okay, you've bypassed it. You can flip the secure flag to insecure. You bypass it again. Or you can just make the end anything less than the start and you bypass it again. So again, this is an another example of how a write vulnerability can easily be used to trivially bypass the secure um, checks within Trust Zone. Um, the other neat thing that they did, and you know, th this, this is just really cool to me because I've like, never really seen it before, but it's a neat feature of ARM. Um, there's the domo domain access control register, and what this basically is, is there's 16 regions of memory on the device. And this basically tells the MMU how to treat accesses to this memory, these memory regions. Should it generate a fault on execute? Should it generate a fault on write? Um, so what we saw before, uh, HTC didn't use the MMU. We, so we were able to just like overwrite code and have it execute, which is terrible. But Qualcomm, they do it right. So we can't just overwrite Qualcomm's code. We have to take one more step. And this is the really neat thing that he did. Um, if you can write all ones into this field, you enter this kind of like binary god mode, which means the MMU is never going to generate a fault. So then, if you write all ones there, instead of using uh, the translation look aside buffer it's for uh, whether it should generate a fault, it'll just allow it. So you can read anything, write anything, execute anything. So that's a really neat technique that um, hopefully I'll get to use someday. Okay. Um, I'm going to segue again. Uh, I'm going to leave uh, Qualcomm a bit behind. So when I've said uh, Trust Zone before this, I've always I say trust zone, but there are tons of implementations of trust zone. Before this point, I meant trust zone as Qualcomm's trust zone implementation. Uh, does anyone in the room know what trusty is? Ooh, do you work at Google? <laughs> <laughs> Lucky guess, huh? <laughs> Maybe you should come up and give, uh, give this piece. Um, but not to ruin the surprise but of uh, sneaky Google. Um, Android has kind of a fragmentation problem. I think everyone in this room knows this. But when we talk about Android fragmentation, what are, what are we really talking about? We think OEMs are adding shared libraries, they're changing functionality, they're adding their own apps, they're changing configuration, they're adding custom OTA updates, carriers are doing the same thing. This is what we think when we think of fragmentation. But Trustone also has um, a fragmentation problem. There are probably a dozen implementations of Trust Zone of varying uh, levels of use um, that just depend on what chipset your phone is running. Um, I think Qualcomm's probably the biggest, but there are, there are several others. Um, and so I will ask you what Trust Zone image runs on the Nexus 6 and the Nexus 9. And from my previous question, I suspect only that one guy in the back of the room knows the answer to this. Um, and the answer is Trusty. Um, Trusty is, an Andro is now an open source project. It, was, it, it appears in the uh, Android repository now. And so we can speculate a bit about motivation because there's this uh, uh, link from the web crypto from last year that talks about what's basically the precursor to Trusty, something called Trusted Little Kernel. And it's an open source version of Trust Zone with the, the ability, or that was probably created with the motivation of lowering the barrier of entry, you know, allowing more devices and more manufacturers to standardize on a trust zone implementation, um, coming to market f and not having to pay their engineers to maintain software that they don't really care about too much. Um, this quote's kind of my favorite from the slide deck. I don't really know what it means, but it's existing trust zone software stacks facing variety of challenges supporting all requirements of our partners, including the defense intelligence communities. 
I'm really curious what the intelligence community's requirements are for Trust Zone. <laughs> um, I hope there aren't any, but I'm now glad there's an open source version of it uh, out there that uh, hopefully other people develop. That this might be a look forward on like where Trust Zone implementations might be going. Um, I don't know. But the big speculation on it is uh, it's likely NVIDIA who uh, developed this, um, who put together this slide deck, wanted a Trust Zone implementation. That was someone else's problem because it'll be cheaper that way. It's my speculation. Um, so the way that it's architected is it builds on an open source kernel called Little Kernel. Um, it's very favorable license, an MIT license. It's on GitHub if you want to look at it. It's, it's a very small kernel. It's something that you would normally think as like a real-time operating system, not like a Linux or you know, like a, a legit operating system. It's very small. Um, it's something that you would expect to see on robotics or some other embedded device like that. Um, hmm? <laughs> um, it's got very basic synchronization primitives. It has IPC. It has threading. Um, but what it doesn't have is the ability to really run within Trust Zone, because you know, we've seen Trust Zone has the secure uh, monitor layer that uh, ARM requires. It has these SMC handlers. There's uh, secure user apps and secure kernel, and that wasn't in LK. And so all of these different things um, were added to it and can kind of be looked at on uh, the Android repository. Um, it's architected. Black doesn't show up very well, but basically just like every other um, Trust Zone implementation, TEE, you have user applications on the Android side that can talk to uh, device drivers, go into the kernel. The kernel can then make the SMC calls over to the secure side, and then those SMC calls can be dispatched to whoever's going to handle them. So the thing that's nice about this as opposed to Qualcomm's implementation is Qualcomm handles all of these SMC calls inside the secure kernel. So, you know, they, they, they handle them here. So that means if there's a vulnerability in those calls, it's kind of game over. Um, this seems to, so the, the problem is the open source version, the apps aren't open source. Um, so I don't really know what the apps do yet. This is kind of a look into future research, kind of something that we want to look into more detail later. This is just, you know, trusted computing, so hopefully it's interesting. But these SMC calls can then pass, be passed up and handled in the trusted app layer. So if there is a vulnerability, it's in this application layer, so you don't, uh, so Trust Zone isn't completely compromised. You then need to find another vulnerability to go from the secure side and user space back down into the secure kernel side. Um, okay, so was there anything else you wanted to add? Um, if you want to, I can, I can hand this back over. This feels weird anyway. Yes? No? Um, not really. No. Okay. So that's all we have for, <laughs> for today. Um, questions? <laughs> Um, in, in your talk, I hear a little tone of unhappiness uh, yeah, underneath. So you, you've, at the picture on the screen shows it quite nicely that it's a fairly complicated ecosystem in general uh, to where you have different companies offering different components. One, one could argue that this is uh, a sign of openness and innovation uh, because you can place different operating systems, even open source ones, uh, on, on these kernels in, in the secure world. You can also do it as you can do it uh, regularly on a, on a normal world as well. And you can run different companies, provide different applications, uh, like we have on, on, like on desktop devices uh, today. And, and that's supposed to be a good thing. But of course, there's also a downside because it makes things more complicated. Uh, you mentioned the APIs that uh, Global Platform developed. and 
th there was an attempt and may not have worked out as people liked it because uh, not everyone uses those APIs and so on and so on. But I, I see, a, see that one of the criticisms that you have is that uh, the implementations are not really open and it's very hard for you to, uh, to analyze them. On the other hand, that's very common in the industry overall. Uh, not everyone has a business model where they want to release everything. Think about graphics drivers, think about baseband modems, even operating systems, uh, and, and also Android, uh, there's, not everything is open. So um, I'm wondering whether the, how, to, how one would actually address this unless you go ahead and build your own company and, and change that uh, state of the game. Uh, it's, and sometimes also, for example, um, when you were complaining about why it's sometimes hard to say well, where you actually addressing your complaint. Is it more on the side of uh, some specific company and implementation of a specific company and architecture uh, feature or what specifically? For example, um, with uh, OpenSSL, when the bug was found, is it a failure of OpenSSL? Is it a failure of DLS standards? Is it a failure of the standardization process overall? Uh, is it a software um, sort of process failure, et cetera, et cetera. So it's often very difficult to see on like, who should you actually blame? And who, what would be the uh, possibility to fix it? So I'm wondering whether you have uh, spent some thoughts on how you could actually uh, make things better. Or how the world could be better, a better place. Uh, there's a lot needs to change. Um, I, I think trusty is an interesting approach that uh, might make it a, a lot more secure because there are a lot of black boxes and you know no one can make everything open source like I, I agree with that you know but trusty is has the potential to be a you know an operating system a secure operating system that you can assess and then people can develop applications that run onto that because like we know that like the DRM APIs and some of the key management is going to be sensitive enough that they're not going to want to open source it. And having small closed source boxes that run within an environment that their compromise doesn't compromise the trusted execution environment. That's something I would like to see. And whether that's trusty, whether that's Qualcomm re-architecting something, whether that's, there's, there's tons of different ways to accomplish that. Um, but I mean, let's see, there was a lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> I don't expect, or I don't even think I would enjoy living in a world where everything was open source. Right? That doesn't magically fix the problem. Um, we had a engagement about a year and a half ago. Uh, someone basically said, I want to do something trusted. I've been told I can do that inside Trusto. I would like to write code and put code inside Trusto. Um, that simple statement was a non-trivial solution. If you were not uh, on the level of Motorola or Netflix, just getting code to run inside. Like, it is very difficult for you to take your laptop, go home, sling some code, and get it to run in Trusto. That's not a thing. Um, we would like it to be a thing, because the original kind of raging against the machine was there's this trusted platform inside of our SOC that is protecting, it's basically just doing DRM, and we would like it to also be able to do secure things for us, the user, right? To bring that secure computation back to the user. Um, so when you hear dissatisfaction in my voice, it's because we can't get there. And so we, we can't get there, and that makes me sad. I would like to store my passwords in it, and I can't. Um, as an aside to that, there is also the architecture of your design and running today prior to Trusty of it looks good on paper, but if we have one simple right zero bug, everything fails. And that is a, if the spec and the implementation of the spec was a little more open and a little more well understood, very like that would be found faster by the community because right now there's just such a high barrier of entry to even do trust zone research. There's not many people doing it. 
and it's a big high value target for an attacker that's not going to get up on stage and be nice and tell you that you found problems. That's what they're designed to answer. Um, the, uh, as a user, I can't uninstall Trustonic from my or TEE from my phone. Does that impact how you guys, how much time you decide to give in the disclosure process? And I'm just curious um, if you can share how either HTC or Qualcomm responded. Um, it'd be intriguing to me, or we could take that offline. Um, I'll cover Qualcomm, and then Charles will cover HTC, which is a funnier story. Um, I've tried to interact with Qualcomm over the years. I think this is year four that I've tried to contact them about issues. Um, sometimes it is met immediately with a lawyer and a cease and desist or a threat thereof. Um, sometimes I'm simply reaching out to Qualcomm and saying, hey, I would like to do this research. Um, and you get met with a cease and desist. They are not an easy company to work with. Uh, I started disregarding those things and giving talks and somehow made the Qualcomm Researcher Hall of Fame. Um, so they're a weird company where they, there's segments inside Qualcomm that get it and wants to make things better and help and they're some of the most friendly, helpful people we've dealt with in industry. Uh, as a whole, they are very difficult to deal with. Um, their disclosure process, we have not had to go through from start to finish, simply because the problems that we found that we decided to make public were in HTC specific code. And we chose to drop Qualcomm things on the floor and not deal with them and talk about HTC because they had a palette that did not start and end with lawyers. Um, I'm going to talk about secure at HTC. Yes, so we did find HTC vulnerabilities, right? And so we did the responsible thing, we disclosed them to HTC. So we uh, found the PGP key for security at HTC.com. We wrote up the vulnerabilities in a very nice way. We sent it to them and we heard nothing back for about two months. And then we get an email and we're like, oh, finally they're, they're responding, they're gonna come out with a fix. And it was, dear, dear Tretis, uh, we were unable to open the email that you sent would you please send it again in plain text? <laughs> we sent it again in plain text. We heard nothing for about another two months. They emailed us back saying, these vulnerabilities have been fixed. Um, we would appreciate it if you would verify, you know, at your later leisure. We're like, oh, cool. We pull out the, the device that we've identified the problem with. We checked for all updates. There are none. It's still vulnerable to the exact same vulnerabilities. We email them back. We say, please give us the firmware with this fix and we'll be happy to verify it for you. And we haven't heard back since. So. And that was a year, a year plus ago now? Yeah, and the update still has not come out with these uh, fixes yet. Hi. Uh, do, you, do you have any recommendations on how to uh, protect against, uh, against uh, what you have done uh, against the trust zone in the Linux level or uh, something else, secure boot? I can't really think of any. Um. <laughs> Exactly. There's nothing like that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's trust zone is signed. It's integrated into secure boot. You can't turn it off. It has to be there. You can't disable anything. Um, you the only way you can compromise is it from the kernel. So you've already com you already kind of assumed that the Android side has been compromised. There's not a lot you can do about it as aside from engage with the vendors. Um, I mean, the one, the one answer to your question that we, I guess, inadvertently are trying 
is to give talks and get people to realize that you should not blindly accept something as being 100% secure just because it is labeled secure. Um, that you should question that and you should always balance out the value of what you are trying to secure with the value of an attacker. Um, I don't think we've ever seen anything that is truly, truly unbreakable, right? Um, at least in the consulting world, we tend to look at what does it cost an attacker to get this information versus what is it going to cost the company if they lose that information. Um, and you can start putting return on investment values there and get a pretty good understanding of I'm, I'm not going to hire a research lab to decap a chip and do physical reverse engineering and spend five million dollars so I can pirate one movie. I, that's ridiculous. Um, is it going to cost me more than ten minutes of my time to pirate a movie? Then yes. Right? So it's, it's a understanding what Trustzone is good at and what it is not good at. Um, instead of just blindly saying, oh, this thing's trusted, it's awesome, let's do everything in it. Let's do all of our e-voting in there. Let's do um, all of our credit card payments. Let's, let's maybe have a second thought before we just say this is magic and it solves our problems and put all eggs in one basket. Because a scary use case that I have is why should, you know, watching a DRM encrypted video, why should watching that video potentially compromise trust zone, which could then, they could use that to steal my personal information, my credit cards, or any information that is stored in the trust zone side. The fact that I'm watching a video should not directly yield to the complete compromise of my device. That's the really scary thing in my head that I don't want to see happen. And this architecture should, in theory, fix it if this architecture is followed. If. Yes. If, if. I mean, if people think back, you know, way in the, you know, the, the, the birth of Linux, right? You were passing physical addresses from user space to the kernel space. They went away from doing that. They went to ioctals, copy from user, all that kind of good stuff. But ARM's trust zone is architected such that you're passing physical buffers back and forth. Like they didn't learn that lesson. And to run on, you know, according to the ARM spec, you have to do that. There's no other alternative. So it's, you know, adding an architecture like that helps, but there's still this underlying flaw of you're passing physical addresses back and forth. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's uh, go for coffee and thank the speakers. Thank you.